Hello everyone and welcome again. Eight people have been killed, four others injured during a mass shooting at a birthday party in South Africa's Eastern Cape province. Two unidentified gunmen randomly shot at guests who were dancing in a Mugenita house party in Kwezakali. And no arrests have been made, but a manhunt is said to be underway. And those killed and injured have not been identified and the owner of the attacked house was among them. According to Eastern Cape Police Commissioner Lillian Minnie, the victims were killed by criminals, and in that those responsible for the cold-blooded attack will be found. South Africa has one of the highest gun crime rates in the world, but random mass shootings are uncommon. Just last year, the country saw a string of shootings in separate taverns, which left more than 20 people dead. The shootings are still under investigation. A Russian research vessel, which has been prospecting for oil and natural gas in the Antarctic, docked in South Africa following protests by green campaigners who say its operations in the region violate a treaty banning mineral exploration. Early this week, several dozen protesters from Greenpeace and Extinction Rebellion demonstrated at the port, saying the ship's seismic surveys in the Antarctic were a threat to marine life in the area and violated a 1958 international agreement. Extinction Rebellion representative Cassie Goodman said the South African government has been complicit in environmental damage by allowing the ship to dock. Now, all the countries that have been exploring, like the Russians and the, the Germans, have a very good map of knowing exactly where everything is. And apparently there's 500 billion barrels of um, fossil fuels under the Antarctic, which would be just a disaster for the planet and for Antarctica if that gets um, extracted. So it's now just exploration, but that goes on to extraction, and we really cannot afford that for for the sake of our planet. We cannot burn any more fossil fuels, and biodiversity loss is just completely a runaway, and we should at least have one little piece of the planet that can still be protected. Our government should really be paying attention and saying, what are you going to do there? Why are you doing that? What technologies are you using? What What is your, the science that you're doing? Why is it, Why do you need to do this? You are looking for fossil fuels. We know you're doing it. I know you're not admitting it, but please but just say no. Say, don't come here if this is your your plan. Don't come and stop over in South Africa. You're making us complicit in the destruction of land Arctic. And back here in Nigeria, the Nigeria leg of the largest multinational maritime exercise in Western and Central Africa has begun in Lagos on Nigeria's new landing ship, the NNS Kada. The exercise in its 13th year has grown from nine participating countries to over 30. A chief of naval staff, Vice Admiral Awal Zuberu Gambo, who was present at the ceremony, attributed the drastic reduction in maritime insecurity in the Gulf of Guinea to the exercise over the years. It's a small restricted crowd aboard the NNS Kada, performing perhaps its first assignment to Nigerian waters since its return from a voyage to Guinea-Bissau in August last year. The special occasion is a flag-off ceremony of exercise Obangame Express 2023 at the Naval Dockyard in Lagos. Special guests are the Chief of Naval Staff, Vice Admiral Awal Zuberu Gambo, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Jeffrey Onyama, the U.S. Consul General in Lagos, Will Stevens, the Commander, U.S. CIS Fleet, Vice Admiral Thomas Ishe, the Flag Officer Commanding of Nigeria's Western Naval Command, Rear Admiral Yakubu Wambai, Senior Naval Officers, Sister Maritime Agencies, and members of the Diplomatic Corps. The Chief of Naval Staff, while hailing the achievements of Obangame exercise over the years, says this year's events will not only further secure the Gulf of Guinea, but would contribute greatly to the African Union's Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. The exercise is designed to improve regional collaboration through joint operations, intelligence sharing and harmonized legal frameworks to enhance collective capabilities of Gulf of Guinea nations against maritime crimes. This year's exercise is particularly instructive considering efforts of the African Union at establishing and operationalizing regional tax forces. This will no doubt enhance the African Continental Free Trade Agreement as well as development of sustainable blue economy. 
which of course is the future of the world. The Minister of Foreign Affairs reiterated the knock-on effect of maritime security on Nigeria's economy and the international partnerships, as well as the President's commitment to it. We're extremely delighted to hear from, you know, becoming a real global black spot, the Gulf of Guinea, that uh, it's almost is virtually zero now, zero piracy. President Mohamedou Buhari um, also attaches great importance uh, to securing the Gulf of Guinea and uh, making it uh, a zone uh, to promote trade. You know, it's reckoned that the, the resources uh, of the oceans, uh, we, we still haven't even started uh, to, um, to tap and to benefit uh, from those resources. For the United States government, Obanga may exercise as part of a long-standing comprehensive strategy by the U.S. government to provide collaborative opportunities among African forces and international partners to address maritime security. We, we don't just need African solutions to African problems. We need African solutions to global problems. And the issues that we're facing today and that we're dealing with in this exercise, counter-narcotics, piracy, IUU, these are global issues and global problems, and, they, and they, they don't just hit the Gulf of Guinea, they hit, hit East Africa, they hit the Caribbean. And one of the great things about exercises like this is, is you learn quickly where the integration isn't happening and how you can work together to, to work to integrate, because only when we work together as governments and within governments can we really work on these, these thorny issues. There are 33 nations across four continents participating in this year's exercise. Obangame is a brainchild of the U.S. Africa Command, part of the U.S. Naval Forces Europe and U.S. Naval Forces Africa, which for more than 80 years has forged strategic partnerships with allies and partners to preserve security and stability. Over in Somalia, the government says it's killed more than 130 fighters from the Islamist militant group Al-Shabaab, including top commanders. It says a joint operation was carried out with Somalia's international partners, which include the U.S. military. A group has recently lost swathes of territory as a result of an operation led by pro-government forces. Now, it's impossible to independently verify the details of this attack, but the Somali government has described what sounds like a significant setback for Al-Shabaab. An information minister said 136 jihadist fighters have been killed in a joint operation with Somalia's international partners. A U.S. ambassador to the United Nations, Sir Linda Thomas-Greenfield, says Eritrean forces are still in Ethiopia, although they've moved to the border between the two countries, contradicting what Ethiopian authorities have said about the Eritreans who have already left. Eritrean troops have fought alongside the Ethiopian military and allied militia in the two-year conflict that pitted the Ethiopian government against rebellion forces in the northern region of Tigray. We have been consistent in our call uh, for foreign troops um, to name Eritrea uh, to leave uh, to leave Ethiopia. Uh, we understand that they have uh, moved back to the border and that they've been asked to to leave uh, Ethi Ethiopia. And I think that's important if uh, this ceasefire is to hold and humanitarian assistance is allowed to continue to flow. The figure for the region for the Horn is about $2.4 billion. So we have successfully helped this region avoid famine, but people are still desperate and the needs are still there. And we're encouraging other countries to contribute to these needs. This is not something the United States can do alone. Uh, and it requires uh, global effort. And part of my reason for this trip is to put eyes on, but to do a call for action uh, by other countries to uh, contribute to this effort. And more than two dozen Madagascans have died and tens of thousands left homeless since a severe tropical cyclone made landfall last week and swirled for days off the island's western coast. Cyclone Chineso smashed into northeastern Madagascar 10 days ago, bringing strong winds and triggering downpours that have caused extensive flooding. 
over the week. It tracked southeastwards, extending damage to houses and schools and cutting off several national roads. According to an update from Madagascar's Office for Risk and Disaster Management, 25 people are now known to have died and 21 others are still missing. Official records stipulate that at least 83,181 people have been affected, with nearly 38,000 displaced from their homes as a result of the disaster. To bilateral relations now, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken is in Egypt starting off the first leg of his three-day visit to the Middle East. Earlier, he spoke with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Blinken also met with Egypt's Foreign Minister Sameh Shukri during the trip. He is expected to address regional issues, including attempts to relaunch a political transition in Sudan and the deadlock between rival factions in Libya. Blinken later heads to Jerusalem, where he'll meet with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu amid concern at home and abroad over the policies of Netanyahu's new right-wing government. We'll have more on uh, Blinken's visit to Egypt in just a bit. In the meantime, Sudanese military leader Abdel Fattah al buran has uh, been in a neighboring chat for talks aimed at cementing ties between the two countries. Local media says General Byrne and the Chadian interim military leader Mohamed Idris Debi met in N'Djamena and renewed their commitment to implement a 2018 bilateral agreement. They also expressed the concern of a communal violence in the countries and agreed to form a joint force to handle insecurity along the border. General Byrne and Mr. Debi agreed to take the necessary steps to tackle irregular migration and weapons smuggling. He also agreed to bolster joint patrols along the tri-border area of the Central African Republic. The U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken in Egypt just a few hours ago, he has already landed in Israel uh, on the second leg of his Middle East tour. While in Egypt, he met with President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, both uh, uh, discussed regional issues. He also met with Egypt's Foreign Minister Samir Shukri. Uh, they also discussed relaunching a political transition in Sudan and the deadlock between rival factions in Libya. Uh, Blinken is on a three-day visit to the Middle East, where he'll be meeting with Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu amid concern at home and abroad over the policies of Netanyahu's right-wing government. The view is Edward Uranian is in Cairo for us. Edward, great to see you. And um, let's just begin with, you know, what exactly this visit is about. I mean, uh, Egypt is supposed to be part of Africa, but here it has been included in um, Mr. Blinken's Middle East tour. So what exactly is the aim here? Well, Amarachi, the situation in Israel um, between the Israeli Israeli government, new Israeli government, and uh, the Palestinians has deteriorated, especially on the ground with violence. So I think um, the real visit, purpose of this visit, at least the Egypt leg, is to get Egypt to put pressure on some of the parties that are involved in this violence and to calm things down. That's usually what the U.S. does, uses Egypt as a lever. I'm not sure how much leverage Egypt has. I mean, it does traditionally have a lot of leverage, but... Uh, some other parties have been bankrolling uh, various Palestinian factions, especially Hamas, uh, to short circuit Egyptian influence. And the, the other discussion points, uh, of course, Sudan is a, a, a great deal of interest and Libya, too. Uh, but I don't think those are the principal points, even though they mentioned them in the press conference uh, with this, the Egyptian foreign minister. Uh, I don't think those are the real reasons for the visit. So what did you glean from, you know, uh, the, the press conference uh, itself uh, just after the, the meeting? He only spent a few hours in Egypt and he said to have met with President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi. Do we have any idea what they discussed and, you know, where this conversation could, how far this conversation could go uh, even after Mr. Blinken's visit? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm only speculating. Uh, 
I, clearly, the obvious speculation uh, is about economic issues. I mean, Egypt is having a lot of pressure on its economy uh, with the rising dollar. Egypt has accused the United States of raising interest rates and putting pressure on countries like Egypt, uh, which have to follow suit to a certain extent, and that has forced down the value of the Egyptian pound. Uh, I suspect that's part of the discussion, uh, although you wouldn't hear it in the media. And the human rights uh, issue, I, I think that's always part of the discussion, but it's not something uh, that really is uh, spoken about, at least in these actual press conferences and uh, by the people, the spokespeople who are uh, talking about it. Uh, the media, Reuters seems to have uh, played that up as the principal a reason for uh, U.S. Secretary of State uh, Blinken's visit. I don't think that is the case at all. As I said, I think it's the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Um, I think the U.S. is trying to, as I say, calm down the situation and jumpstart peace talks. And Egypt, even though it can't pressure the parties to stop uh, quarreling on the ground, fighting on the ground, doing whatever they're doing on the ground, uh, it can get perhaps the parties to sit down at the table and uh, negotiate. That, that is one of the things Egypt can do. Yes, and we know that you have more to discuss in Israel, especially with the recent attacks in the West Bank. Uh, I think during last week and as well over the weekend, um, uh, we heard world leaders, you know, condemn uh, the attacks uh, on, on the Israeli side in the West Bank uh, over the weekend. But then we forget that the, the Israeli uh, forces did carry out a raid on the Palestinian side just a week ago, and there was no condemnation about that. Um, is that criticism, however, for the, the way the U.S. Uh, has perceived both sides and, you know, what Lincoln could likely be addressing during his visit? Once again, I think what part the parties say in public, it does not reflect what they're actually talking about. I think condemnation is something people do for the media. Um, and I think behind the scenes, what they're really trying to do is get people to negotiate to calm things down. Condemning uh, things, clearly anyone can condemn something. The fact that they don't condemn it is perhaps indicative of which side they support. Uh, it happens in both cases. I mean, the Arab um, Arab summits, the Arab uh, uh, Arab League uh, meetings always talk about supporting the Palestinians. And yet, if you talk to the diplomats themselves, they're pretty fed up with the, the Palestinians and their unwillingness to negotiate. So uh, what they say in private and what they say in public are two different things often. Thank you, Edward. I know you have your eyes uh, on this meeting. Uh, three country, three nation tour or three day tour of the Middle East. Uh, lots to talk about, I guess. We'll just keep our ears open for the rest of it. Thanks again, Edward. You're welcome. Well, to economic growth, where experts believe China's economic recovery will drive global development following the United Nations reports, which predicts China's economy will grow by 4.8% in 2023. A UN World Economic Situation and Prospects 2023 report says China's economy will grow faster than the 3% growth it managed last year. After the government adjusted its COVID policies in late 2022 and eased monetary and fiscal policies to promote consumption. China has sufficient uh, adequate fiscal space, if you like, to provide more uh, uh, support measures to the economy as you go through this uh, adjustment uh, period. There's a big focus by policymakers on the quality of growth. Firstly, there's a shift, as you know, away from an investment-led economic growth strategy towards more consumption-led. And therefore, stimulating domestic consumption remains a very core part of that uh, strategy. Well, an artist has taken a big step in ensuring that he fills the gap between the farm and the table. It's not a very long road, though. And that's to lessen the struggles of people when storing food to show what he that he means business. He organized an art exhibition in Iwaya in Lagos State to showcase food preservation methods and reignite the culture of food dehydration. Oh, nice. 
Nigerian artist Olufela Omokeko is using exhibitions to ignite conversations on the importance of food preservation in a country where nearly half of the food produced gets spoiled due to lack of quick access to markets and cold chain logistics. During a recent exhibition in Iwaya, a slum in commercial capital Lagos, guests had a taste of his puree from dried tomatoes and peppers as he showcased age-old traditions on how to extend the shelf life of perishable food. The main message of this exhibition is, is the possibility of, of creation using, using, using materials that, that, that are not constantly used by artists. And also the place of food. How can we preserve our food? Nicknamed son of a pepper seller, Omokeko grew up seeing women who sell perishables at their homes or at the market throw away their wares because it quickly rotted. That problem remains as evident in the almost bulk peppers in the market. Omokeko is reminding Nigerians of how to dry and blend food to preserve its lifespan while also maintaining same taste. For me as an artist, how, I ask myself, how can I also reflect the, the rise in price of goods and also scarcity of goods that we experienced last year, particularly during the, during the flood period and also the, the, the Ukraine and Russia war that caused increase in price. His pieces consisting of okra, Red and green peppers are mounted on boards. Local spices that can be infused while blending the peppers are seen hanging on ropes from the ceiling. All already dehydrated and blended exhibits are seen in transparent bottles. There's a wide belief that vegetables are better when fresh, but Omakeko hopes that taking his exhibition will make people understand that proper dehydration will still keep nutrients intact, inhibit the growth of bacteria, and maintain the same great taste. I'm sure that you will go nicely with a plate of rice. I don't think we missed it. Uh, the weekend's uh, stories and uh, stories and happenings that made news over the weekend. Italian Prime Minister Giorgia Meloni visited Tripoli on Saturday to conclude an $8 billion gas deal aimed at boosting energy supplies to Europe despite the insecurity and political chaos in the North African country. Meloni met Libya's Prime Minister Abdul Hamid al-Dabiba, head of the internationally recognized government of national unity in Tripoli, before the energy deal was signed for talks that also focused on migration across the Mediterranean. Today, we discuss issues of mutual interest, including opportunities to develop cooperation in energy, illegal migration and economic cooperation, as well as coordinating the political positions of the two countries. We clearly express our support for the efforts of the UN mission to Libya and the efforts of Special Envoy Abdullahi Batili. Signing the deal, Libya's National Oil Corporation Chief Farhat Bengdara and the head of the Italy's ENI, Claudio Descalzi, say they'll invest $8 billion in gas development as well as in solar power and carbon capture. This visit to Tripoli is, and not surprisingly, one of my first institutional visits to the Mediterranean area, and it shows that Libya is a priority for Italy. We are determined to confirm our constant commitment to support the Libyan authorities in the management of migratory flows and in assisting local communities. We have, among other things, on our own initiative on the subject of the Migration Fund, but we believe that this must do more. European countries have increasingly sought to replace Russian gas with energy supplies from North Africa and elsewhere over the past year because of the war in Ukraine. And on Sunday, Tunisia opened polling stations for runoffs in a parliamentary election that drew only 11% turnout in the first round last month, an outcome critics of the president said undermined his claims of public support for sweeping political change. The Tunisian president, Kais Saeed, has decreed the new, mostly powerless parliament as part of a reconfigured presidential system that he introduced after shutting down the previous parliament in 2021 and assuming broad control over the state.
The head of the Electoral Commission gave a provisional turnout of 11.3% for Sunday's runoff votes. Opposition parties boycotted the poll, accusing the president of staging a coup after he shut down parliament in 2021 and gave himself almost unlimited executive power. According to the Electoral Commission, about 887,000 voters cast ballots from a total electorate of 7.8 million. The low turnout reflected Tunisian people's lack of confidence in the path of the president. Economic decline in Tunisia, where some basic goods have disappeared from shelves and the government has cut subsidies as it seeks a foreign bailout to avert bankruptcy, has left many disillusioned with politics and angry with their leaders. That's Network Africa today. Thanks for watching. I'm Amarachi Bani.